Jason Spaulding is a jerk, potentially the biggest jerk in the entire galaxy. Solara Brooks would know, since she's working as his servant in exchange for a ride to the Outer Realms. Life in the Outer Realms will be hard, dirty, and lawless. But Solara craves to be somewhere people won't care that she has engine grease under her fingernails and felony tattoos across her knuckles. But before she can get to the Outer Realms, Doran tries to kick her off their ship at an outpost where she will either die or be forced to do terrible things to survive. And all because he saw her tattoos that mark her as a felon. In a fit of fear and anger, Solara tasers Doran with a nerve agent that temporarily scrambles his brain and makes him forget that he's one of the richest heirs in the galaxy. Now, Solara and Doran are on the run on a ship called the Banshee, avoiding the law and puzzling out the eccentric crew helping them. If you're a fan of the show Firefly, science fiction, or just want to go on an adventure that will keep you guessing, check out Melissa Lander's Starflight. This morning, Katie thought breaking up with Ezra was the hardest thing she'd have to do. This afternoon, her planet was invaded. The year is 2575, and two rival mega corporations are at war over a planet that's little more than an ice-covered speck at the edge of the universe. Too bad nobody thought to warn the people living on it. With enemy fire raining down on them, Katie and Ezra, who are barely even talking to each other, are forced to fight their way onto an evacuating fleet with an enemy warship in hot pursuit but their problems are just getting started. With one ship severely damaged, they won't be able to outrun the enemy for long. Plus, a deadly plague has broken out and is mutating with terrifying results. Basically, space zombies. The fleet's artificial intelligence, which should be protecting them, may actually turn out to be their enemy, and nobody in charge will say what's really going on. As Katie hacks into a tangled web of data to find the truth, it's clear only one person can help her bring it all to light the ex-boyfriend she swore she'd never speak to again. As she and Ezra dig deeper into the truth, they are forced to confront their deepest fears in order to survive. Told through a fascinating dossier of hacked documents, including emails, schematics, military files, IMs, medical reports, interviews, and more, Illuminate is a book about lives interrupted, the price of truth, and the courage of everyday heroes. Sierra Santiago is looking forward to the perfect summer. Class is finally out, she has a close group of friends to hang out and party with, and best of all, she has the perfect summer gig, painting murals on the walls of old buildings in Brooklyn. But when she starts work on her first mural, she notices something strange going on with the other paintings around her. For one thing, they're fading way faster than normal. And for another, well, it almost seems like they're moving. Most confusing of all, when she gets home, her grandfather, who hasn't spoken since his stroke, suddenly wakes up and starts talking directly to her. She has to finish the mural she's painting, he says and she needs to do it as fast as possible, before it's too late. Sierra is thrown. What could a giant picture of a dragon have to do with anything? And what does her grandfather mean about the time running out? At first, this all seems ridiculous to Sierra, but when she goes to a party with a group of her friends, suddenly the danger is all too real. A zombie crashes the party and attacks her. Sierra narrowly escapes, and she sets out with her friends in search of answers. Along the way, she'll face the walking dead, living paintings, and her family's tangled past. To find out what happens, read Shadow Shaper by Daniel Jose Older. In Caroline County, Virginia, in 1955, amidst segregation and prejudice, injustice and cruelty, two teenagers fell in love. Their life together broke the law in Virginia and 16 other states. Richard Loving was white and Mildred Jeter was black. They were thrown in jail and out of the state of Virginia but they were determined to fight and return to their home. And this set the stage for a fight that would go all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. Patricia Ruby Powell's Loving versus Virginia tells Mildred and Richard's story through a mixture of poetry, rich illustrations, and archival documents, which situates the Loving story within the broader fight for civil rights during the 1960s. It's the perfect book for your next school project. When the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that laws prohibiting interracial marriage amounted to legalized prejudice on June 12, 1967, the Lovings were able to return to their home and raise their family. But it was still many years before the remaining 16 states struck these discriminatory laws from their books. The last state to remove the law was Alabama in the year 2000. Check out Loving vs. Virginia to learn more. This is Ever the Hunted by Erin Summerill. In the law's eyes, I'm illegitimate. To Mosa Malam, 
I am Sheridanian. But to some, those gossip mongers in Brenton, I'm a traitor's daughter. None of that matters to me though, because like my father, I will always be Flannery and I can take care of myself. 17-year-old Britta Flannery is at ease only in the woods with her dagger and her bow. Now outcast and alone and having no rights to her father's land or inheritance, she seeks refuge where she feels most safe, the Everwoods. When Britta is caught poaching by the Royal Guard, instead of facing the noose, she is offered a deal, her freedom in exchange for her father's killer. However, it's not so simple. The accused killer is the only friend she's ever known, the boy who broke her heart and the king's own bounty hunter. For the first time in my life, I loathe my body's strange ability to tell the truth. Not Cohen, not my Cohen. He couldn't have killed Papa. And yet, there's no denying the evidence. Papa was all I had left. My decision is for him. I press my hand to the pain beneath my sternum and say, I'll go. Britta sets out on a dangerous quest in a world of warring kingdoms, mad kings, and dark magic to find her father's killer. But Britta wields more power than she knows, and soon she will learn what has always made her different will make her a force to be reckoned with. Think of a wish, any wish. Maybe you want to forever color your hair blue, or to no longer be plagued by acne. Or perhaps you wish to be able to fly as effortlessly as a bird. I trust you have all gathered your wishes. What if I told you your wish could come true, but you had to rip out each and every single one of your teeth? And daughter of smoke and bone, there's the world we humans know, and then the seedy, strange underworld where the devil's magic works if you have some teeth. Human teeth work the best. But we humans, we don't know about it. The only human privy to this life is Carew. Carew is the errand girl for a devil who collects human teeth. And although his work is connected to vile, evil people, people who would rip out your teeth for their wishes, the only creature that makes this devil afraid is the one we believe to be pure and good. And those are angels. And by the end of this book, you'll know that even angels can be monsters. If you're looking for a good fantasy, read Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lainey Taylor. I was sent here because of a boy. His name was Reeve Maxfield and I loved him and then he died and almost a year passed and no one knew what to do with me. So here I am at the Wooden Barn, which is described in the brochure as a boarding school for emotionally fragile, highly intelligent teenagers. That is how we are introduced to Jam Gallahue a high school student who doesn't want to get on with her life after losing her boyfriend, Reeve. So her parents send her to the wooden barn. Jam hates everything about the wooden barn. The fact that she has a roommate, the other kids who are super awkward and don't talk to her, and the lack of internet access. On the first day of classes, Jam learns that she's been signed up for an exclusive, supposedly life-changing class called Special Topics in English that focuses only and entirely on the works of Sylvia Plath, who's this poet who died like 50 years ago. Jam can't wait to go home, but then a journal writing assignment leads Jam into a mysterious other world that she and her classmates call Beljar. In Beljar, Jam discovers a realm where the untainted past is restored and she can feel Reeve's arms around her once again. As the pages of her journal begin to fill up, Jam must confront hidden truths and decide what she's willing to sacrifice in order to reclaim her loss. Check out Beljar by Meg Wolitzer. Have you ever played Truth or Dare? Nerve is kind of like Truth or Dare, but with all dares and amazing prizes. If you're gutsy enough, you could get clothes, money, pretty much anything you've ever wanted. But how far would you go? If somebody offered you everything that you had ever liked online just to do a dare, would you? When V decided she wanted to play, she had no idea what she was getting into, only that she would get some awesome prizes out of it. But when dares escalate from pranks to life and death situations, will she have the nerve to see it through? Read Nerve by GN Ryan. We dare you. Trivia time. I'm gonna ask you some questions and I want you to just blurt out the answer. I'm gonna give you about five seconds for each one. So let's jump right in. What continent is Kenya on?
All right, hopefully you all knew the answer to that. And Kenya is in Africa, okay? Kenya is in Africa. All right, question two. What are the two opposing colors in a game of chess? Black and white are the two opposing colors in a game of chess. Okay, now I want you to just name any animal. All right, raise your hand if you answered zebra to this question. Gotcha. Some of you may have also said an animal that lives in Africa or an animal that's black and white, so like penguin or lion, right? Um, so when asked this series of questions, 20% of people will actually answer zebra. But when asked to name an animal just randomly without the questions about Africa and black and white in front of it, less than 1% of people will name a zebra as their animal. So basically, I kind of tricked you into thinking about the thing I wanted you to think about, and that's called priming. So priming is a brain bug that can be used for good. So your teachers actually probably use priming when they're setting up their lessons plan, but it can also be used for less noble purposes than education. So politicians and advertisers use this trick to make you think about certain things as you say, walk into a grocery store or maybe even a voting booth. But priming is not the only brain bug. So if you've ever wondered why people are superstitious or thought about how advertising works or why people gamble even though they know the house will win, well, Dean Bunamano has some answers for you in his easy to read, extremely interesting book, Brain Bugs, How the Brain's Flaws Shape Our Lives. Today I'll be book talking Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda by Becky Albertalli. From hour to hour, note to note at gmail.com to bluegreen118 at gmail.com. Subject, read all of the above. Okay, first of all, Oreos absolutely qualify as a food group. Second of all, they're the only food group that matters. Anyway, I forgive you for your ignorance. I know you didn't realize you were talking to an expert. Jack. Jack, it's true. I had no idea I was talking to such an Oreo connoisseur. Uh, so doctor, how many servings of Oreo products are necessary for a balanced diet? I'm getting the impression you have a bit of a sweet tooth. Blue. I can't imagine why you'd think that. All right, I have a sneaking suspicion that you're not 100% committed to your Oreo diet. Signed, Jack. Simon Spear, AKA Jack, isn't ready to come out yet, but at 16, he's in his first sort of relationship with another guy. During the day, he logs onto his Gmail on the school computers and chats with the mysterious Blue, another boy at his high school who's also in the closet. They vent about their days, flirt, share jokes, and talk about the benefits of eating Oreos for breakfast. But neither one knows who the other is. That is, until Simon forgets to log out of his email and another student decides to blackmail him. His classmate, Martin, wants Simon to set him up on a date with Abby, one of Simon's best friends. And if he doesn't, he'll out him to the rest of the school. There's a serious problem with that plan, though. Abby isn't interested in Martin, like, at all. As if things weren't complicated enough, Simon's online relationship with Blue is getting more serious, and Simon's beginning to wonder if it might not be worth the risk to reveal their identities to each other so they can finally meet in person. Blue isn't so enthusiastic about this idea, and now Simon's forced to walk a tightrope as he tries to appease his blackmailer without risking his relationships with his friends, his family, and Blue. If you're a fan of romance, drama geeks, and snarky humor, Check out Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda by Becky Albertalli. A Week of Mondays by Jessica Brody. No one likes to live through a bad day. Imagine living through a bad day seven times, even worse, the same bad day. Ellison Sparks had to do exactly that. Here are the highlights of her bad day. It was Monday. She woke up late for school. The reason she woke up was due to a text. It was a breakup text from her boyfriend. In addition, she knocked a glass of water over on a homework assignment due that day. She gets downstairs and her parents are having a full-blown argument in the kitchen and her younger sister is just being obnoxious. This is all before 8 a.m. The day continues in misery mode. It's rainy, she has no umbrella, and it's class picture day. So she looks miserable by the time she arrives to school. En route to school, she gets a speeding ticket. At school, she also ends up having a horrible allergic reaction to some homemade banana nut bread, thus going in front of the entire school, she was running for student body vice president, and delivering an incomprehensible speech through swollen lips. After school, she tanks the softball tryouts, goes to a state fair, where her boyfriend breaks up for real with her in person. 
Her last words as she's drifting to sleep are, please just let me do it over. Please just give me another chance. I swear I'll get it right. She gets seven tries. Does she get it? Find out in a week of Mondays. Everyone has heard of Sherlock Holmes and John Watson, the daring duo that risked their lives solving crimes in Victorian England. But have you ever wondered what happened to the descendants of Holmes and Watson? Holmes' children are taught deduction from an early age and still shine in the spotlight. Watson's descendants are less notorious, but often linked to a Holmes of their generation. Jamie Watson is convinced that the only decent thing about being shipped off to a boarding school in Connecticut will be meeting his Holmes, Charlotte Holmes. But it isn't the instant, intense friendship that he'd always dreamed of. Curt, beautiful, and intensely intelligent, Charlotte is more like her ancestor Sherlock than Jamie ever could have imagined. She also has a habit of alienating and manipulating the people around her, a habit that is driving Jamie away from the one person he'd always dreamed of befriending. But when a student at their school is killed in a way straight out of a Sherlock Holmes story, Jamie and Charlotte are forced to work together to solve a mystery like their ancestors before them. Find out if Jamie and Charlotte can learn to work together or if whatever is behind the murder will finally take down the infamous Sherlock and Holmes duo by reading A Study in Charlotte by Brittany Cavallaro. Have you ever made a decision you regret? What if, when you make that decision, there's another version of yourself in another universe making the opposite decision? And with each and every decision you make, a new and different universe and a new different version of yourself is created. This idea is called the multiverse, and it's a hypothetical set of possible universes, including the universe that we live in. So what happens when you meet your soulmate? But you can only be together in different universes. Natasha is a girl who believes in science and facts not fate, not destiny, or dreams that will never come true. She's definitely not the kind of girl who meets a cute boy on a crowded New York City street and falls in love with him. Not when her family is 12 hours away from being deported to Jamaica. Falling in love with him won't be her story. Daniel has always been the good son, the good student living up to his parents' high expectations, never the poet or the dreamer. But when he sees her, he forgets about all of that. Something about Natasha makes him think that fate has something much more extraordinary in store for both of them. Every moment in their lives has brought them to this single moment. A million futures lie before them. Which one will come true? Find out in The Sun is Also a Star by Nicola Yoon.